disclaimer, understand that this is a risky business, which if you're trading with leverage, you need to be aware that there's a high possible chance that you can lose money quickly. There's upsides, there's downsides of this game. There's stories of people doing very, very well. There's stories of people who are not doing very, very well. Just understand the kind of the trade-off we're taking here. Um, okay, so I love to put a quote in. The goal of a successful trader is to make the best trades. Money is secondary. Alexander Elder, absolutely perfect. Could not agree more. And and, the, and the, actually, you know, just to sidestep slightly, the, the sooner we can disconnect from the financial aspect of trading, the easier it becomes. Like it, it doesn't fix everything overnight, but the easier it becomes to kind of size up, to do all the other things that we want to do, to kind of disconnect ourselves from jump loss, from drawdown, from kind of new highs and equity curve. It's really, it's really important. Maybe we'll address that at some point uh, in the future on its own. Okay, so reminder, my opinion only. I'm not here to give you advice. Take responsibility for your own work and trades. If some ideas sort of spark your interests, you know, be inquisitive, explore yourself, research. Things take time. So, you know, if you're going to change something, especially with this topic, stop loss, then, you know, again, my opinion is to change things, adjust your plan, run with it for a bit, and then audit the performance rather than the classic mistake of, oh, I changed the way I did my stops. It didn't work for a couple of days. I'm going to go back. You know, give yourself time to see how little changes in your trading approach and the operational side of the of, of your trading impact the performance, the results, the way you feel about stuff, your mindset, all this type of other things. So implement the change, stick to it. Right. Just a reminder, now a nice feature if you are in the UK, a UK-based trader, active trader, you can now spread bet on TradingView with Pepperstone so you get the benefits of TradingView. And now it's in a nice tax-free wrapper you get all the tax advantages of trading via a spread bet before you can only trade CF cfds now you can trade spread bet and cfd obviously if you're not in the uk carry on with your cfd if you're in the uk consider having a look at the spread bet option okay so a little bit about me i'll be really quick on this my name is mark holstead if you go to tradersmastermind.com tradersmastermind.com yeah, uh, there's a little bit about me there how it all started my journey as a trader um i've been trading 20 plus years and there you'll find kind of loads of articles, loads of resources, the podcast there, daily email there to kind of help you out. There's, there's plenty of stuff to kind of dig into. And if you want to kind of take things to another level and upgrade things and join the community, then you're very, very welcome to as well. There's a premium option there. But there's lots of lots of valuable content on there that's no charge. Okay, so stop losses. So what I want to do today is um, avoid crowded stop levels that's the main thing we're kind of going to look at then i want to look at golden rules that i use for tight stops then let's talk about some things which are <laughs> controversial yeah maybe who cares we're not trying to please people here we're trying to make more money in the markets we're trading keep most of that money that's the what we're trying to do right so i'm talking about time-based stops close of the bar breaking up stops a little bit discretion-based stops oh scary <laughs> i'm joking we'll get to that in a minute why people think that's scary and actually there is a big kind of caveat to it but i think it's something to consider when did we kind of drag the stop to break even and then we'll do a time for a q a so everyone's sitting around waiting for fed i guess tomorrow not much chugging on markets ping coining back and forth but did you know oops i knocked over my coffee cup there got so excited did you know uh the orange juice futures are actually going to multi-year highs so if you're looking to you know, trade something a little bit different then um i'm not recommending you trading in these products but i can now and then i scan the commodities i very very rarely trade commodities uh much prefer the indices but now and then something comes across your, your desk and you go oh, it's interesting i know it's orange juices wait for it wait for the pun squeezing higher yes yeah, squeezing higher yeah i'm better trader than i'm comedian luckily okay so uh i didn't even prepare that either. that just came to me well natural comedian <laughs> okay what do the textbooks say let's get back to some serious business what do the textbooks say so textbooks are telling you and i took this from investopedia so you can go and check it out yourself and this is what is a stop loss and basically it says I've got this highlighted. Uh, an investor, you can try, you can change investor for trader, determines the most recent support level of the stock and places the stop loss just below that level. So in other words, they see the support and you place your stop under support, uh, or you move it with a moving average, right? That's what everyone is told to do. And 
that's okay in some instances and we'll look at where i think that's feasible and fair and 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 viable and then other times we don't really want to be doing what the textbook says we want to be smarter than that we want to be cleverer we want to really take things up a notch Bear with me while i look at this why are you flashing at me go to meeting let me check two seconds okay no problem the recording is just moving on to the local host for some reason fine whatever we'll sort it uh we need to be smarter than that so our goal our goal is to risk as little as possible to make as much as possible and i what i mean by that is that's that's honestly isn't that our goal or our, everyone's trying to achieve that's a trader we don't want to risk a massive amount and we want to make as much as we possibly can so each trade that's our north star but we then we don't want to stop too tight that we're just getting pinged out all the time have you done this i'm pretty sure if you've been trading for more than a few months you have done this you've taken a trade you've got a great idea you've got a great level you execute you put the trade in you move your stop up it's too tight it gets pinged out on noise the trade goes without you maybe you take another it gets pinged out again that's that death by a thousand cut syndrome so we don't want to when we say risk as little as possible we don't have a really really tight stop on everything we do because we're just going to ping out on noise ping 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 and that's just going to frustrate you you end up risking more and losing more than you intended and similarly don't have a stop too wide right you can say well how do i never get stopped out well i'll have a wide stop and yeah some people like to operate like that but for me i want to again go back to that north star risk as little as possible to make as much as possible from the trade so and we need to find that sweet spot and one of the things that we really need to do is avoid those crowded stop levels and the final point that i want to make before we kind of dig dig into things is we're not trying to avoid being stopped right stops are good they're there to protect us against a trade that is not going in our way right but we want to be as efficient as we possibly can with the stop so let's not look at a stop as a negative thing let's look at a stop as a valuable thing and it's there to make take us out the trade at a maximum loss that we define before the market carries on and on and on right because without a stop when we're trading leverage go back to the first slide that's when things get nasty so we want to use them and look at them and re and, and just sidestep slightly here let's not frame them negatively in our mind you know, I'm very much a believer of, you know, how we think about things in trading, how we digest them internally. You know, stop shouldn't be said, oh, I've got a stop loss in there. You know, it should be considered as a positive thing. It's like, hey, I need, this is good. It's going to help me from having a, a loss I don't really want, but I just need to be mindful of where to put it. Okay, so let's have a quick word about tight stops. So I, you know, we go to a, th a death by a thousand cut syndrome, but I believe that some setups should have a tight stop, right? They should have a tight stop momentum play maybe a flag maybe an exhaustion play that flushes lower and pops back up a breakout and i put there anywhere your trade thesis is asking or demanding immediate momentum because that makes sense right because what if your trade thesis is we're going from a to b let's imagine along a to b but also it's a momentum ignition type trade i'm buying that breakout i'm buying the momentum there's the two parts of the thesis one is the direction and one is the momentum and if momentum is not there you don't want to be in the trade and the idea of a stop is you come out when the trade thesis is negated or invalidated whatever you want to say so if we've got two parts to that specific play that specific setup that momentum play momentum plus direction if momentum's not there then tight stop makes sense now if we decide that we want to just just predict direction if you like or speculate on direction a to b play but we don't think there's that initial momentum. We think it might hesitate round, maybe it retests the level, maybe it comes back, kisses the pin bar, all this type of stuff. Then maybe we don't need that tight stop. Maybe we don't want that tight stop. So think about what your thesis is, what your expectations are from the trade. And so I do believe that we can have a tight stop in some situations. So I'm not saying don't use a tight stop, but I'm saying be very mindful and be considered about when you execute that. So a couple of chart examples, recent chart examples. Let's say Tesla um, gaps up, gap and go strategy. You're buying a breakout, right? And again, it's just a simple idea here. You would probably not want to have a stop right under the low of the day. It's too wide. It doesn't make sense. If you're buying a breakout, you want it to go. Maybe it's going to you know, do a little bit of maneuvering, but you're, you're not going to you're not going to have a massively wide stop on it. You want a reasonably tight stop. Same if you traded the opening range breakout the other day um on the dax right you 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 you've got it there you know you're going to buy that 15 minute high okay great 
you don't want to be giving that too much room potentially if it's momentum ignition play and that was like a v-shaped reversal but the idea is your thesis has to be aligned with it. so don't rule out tight stops but just be mindful that you know under the momentum plays then i think they're valid personally but if you're not trading momentum if you're trading in reversion all the stuff i think they're worse they're a worse sort of tool to use so okay let's look about let's uh talk about should i say avoiding crowded stop levels so <laughs> If you think about the stats, right, and you go back, you look at the stats, we know it's not a secret that the majority of retail traders aren't getting the results they want, right? And that's okay. And if that's you, that's okay too, because everyone goes through a developing phase, comes out of the developing phase, not everybody comes out of it, to be honest, but that's hopefully you come through a developing phase, come out of it and start getting the results you want. But when we're looking at you know, what the majority of traders are doing, they're all doing very similar things. Like a lot of them are putting their stops in the same levels. A lot of them are saying this market can't go any higher. A lot of them are saying, you know, there's, there's commonalities. And I don't want to kind of get sidetracked too much about the thinking of a retail trader, but I want to keep stay focused on stops for now. You know, imagine if you go back to that Investopedia article and you see all the things that people saying, put a stop here and put a stop there. A crowded level is under a low, above a high, is any big key level. And so... You know, it, sometimes it's hard to, to not put your stop there because the structure makes sense. You're trying to structure the trade, you're trying to get a good risk reward ratio on the trade and all this sort of stuff. But I think it makes more sense to only use a crowded stop level as a last resort. And just think, even if you don't like, oh, I don't know what Mark's talking about there, just think a little bit. Like if the majority of people are putting their stop in the same place, this isn't, this isn't always the case, of course, I'm making a generalization here, but if that's the case and the majority of people aren't getting the results they want, why don't we think about doing the opposite? Well, the very least, not the same. Is the same the opposite? Not the same the opposite? <laughs> not quite, but you get the point. We're not saying necessarily that you're going to buy when they're out of stock, or maybe you could, but you're saying, hey, this is crowded. I feel like everyone's got their stop here. And I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist per se and say, oh, the market drives and it goes on these kind of moves and it purposely grabs your stop. I'm more of a prescriber to the supply demand um, sort of thesis, if you like, where you know market moves to liquidity. If there's an excess in supply, then the market's going to move lower, and that will only stop when the supply drops off or demand steps up. Right? It's like that seesaw balance. So supply, 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 and very often when you go through low, you get a last burst of supply coming in because that's the stops being triggered, and then demand steps in because it was a previous level, it was an interesting level, maybe there's some algo stepping up, that kind of thing, and so it just shifts. And so I often think that that's really why market trades, you know, tests, hunts liquidity, looks for liquidity and reverses. I've got time to tell you a little story. I have got a little time to tell you a story, but I'll rank it really, really brief. I used to subscribe to, and many of you have heard this story before, um, if you've been on this, these webinars and, and, and other bits, but I used to subscribe to a service that would kind of, you could hear the S&P 500 pit, right? And this guy would constantly uh, if you hear the pit, you hear the noise, and when the market was moving, it was wild. You could hear the noise of the pit, the roar, the open outcry pit, you know, where people were shouting to each other to execute orders. And there's one, uh, the guy who was offering the service that you subscribe to would also tell you what was going on. So he would say, ah, oh, Goldman's coming to sell, uh, you know, or it's quiet. And, you know, sometimes locals would be like throwing tickets around each other and chucking and just chatting nothing was going on so that was a good kind of indicator not to get involved in the market right just chop this is the s&p 500 pit i'm missing out parts of it here so i'm trying to conclude this story quickly for you anyway there's a guy called number one local number one local big trading big hitter um big size aggressive man all this type of stuff he would come in and he would recognize a lot of locals were positioned long and locals would often take the other side of so-called paper they would take the positions and they would offload them later on and make a little bit of a margin on that so that was the idea they were kind of market makers if you like he would recognize when they had a lot of inventory long he would then come in and he would bid sorry he wouldn't bid he would offer below the market so let's say, let's say the bid was 95 he'd come in and offer 94 being and being obviously you did that electronically now you get filled straight away at 95 right but in the pit, that would create confusion. So long story short, he would come in and aggressively sell, sell, sell. 93s, 92s, 90s, 89s, 88s. And he'd hear this guy saying, he's bidding below, he's offering below, sorry, he's offering below, he's 80, he's 80 off, he's 76 off. And he would push it. And this is when there was kind of a bit more trade in the pit versus the electronic. Now it's a pretty different story, of course. But when it was quieter, 
you know, the movement in the pit would influence electronic futures. And it was a kind of a little bit more fragmented like that. He would come in and he would sell, 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 knowing there was a lot of people who were stuck long. And he would always, I say always, majority of the time, he would look and he would wait for a print below the low of the day or the prior low of the day. And when he got that, he knew there was a load of stops sitting there waiting to come in, sell stops that were paper, sell stops, whatever they were from. And he knew that he could, he could, that would create the cascade and he could exit the trade and he'd be done. And he would, this would be kind of a, a common thing he would do under certain conditions. He would do this. There kind of had to be a quiet market. He had to have like kind of this happen and that happen. And he would try it sometimes. It wouldn't work and he'd walk away out of the pit. But very often he'd do this. And when he got it rolling and going and he kind of created this little cascade of momentum, the point of the story is he would always look for that liquidity under the low. He would always look and see the stops being triggered under the low. That would create a last little cascade of, of selling coming in. He'd cover all his position and he'd walk out of the pit. And so this hunting for liquidity isn't new. It's kind of what happens. So we don't want to be the sucker on the other side of that deal. We either don't want to be in the deal and let it happen and then play a kind of game of chess and thinking a little bit more strategically of how we could play this game, or at the very least, we don't want to have a stop in the same position. Okay, so um, let's consider this. Let's go back to strategies now. Enough stories about guys in the pit splitting up your stop. So one thing to consider, which I don't think many traders do, is we often split up our buy orders, right, or, or our entry orders, should I say, and we say, I'll buy some here, I'll scale and add this, but very rarely do we split up our stop. Why is that? And you might say, well, it's because if you pass the level, yeah, fine, I get it. You know, sometimes you might, you know, want to just come out of a trade and 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 that's be done, but sometimes you might want to put your stop in a crowded level. And you kind of like, oh, um, I need to put it on this level low here, really, because if I have it too far, the risk order ratio is screwed up. I don't want it too close. It's kind of in that zone where you want to take it. The market's turning. You feel it's turning. You see the price action shift. Maybe you see an ignition bar, whatever it is. You're like, I kind of, all right, what I'll do is I'll split up my stop order. I'll put half here and half there. So let me give you an example. Um double sort of bottom here it's low it's coming down it's tested low retested the low it's a bit of support there from pre-market um what are we in here and nasdaq i don't know why i've got the little something covering the thing it's definitely a nasdaq um coming down it's testing you like it's a reasonable place to go long and a reasonable stop area is like under that low and you don't want it too much further right because that ruins the structure of the deal if the structure of the deals like oh, i've got a, i'm looking for a pushback to view apple push back to highs and you've got to have a massive stop for it then the rvr of the trade risk reward ratio of the trade might become one and you don't want one you want two you want three you want four you want as much as you can within the structure of the trade that you're taking the structure of the day you're taking you can't demand 10 to 1 all the time of course but within the structure of the day, you might be like, oh, so what do you do? Because a reasonable stop area. And, you know, if you had a stop in a reasonable stop area, you you could get pinged. In this example, you got pinged, right? You got stopped out. The market came down. You took that double bottom. It started to go back up. It sat there, did one last flush, and then popped to rally back up. So one thing to consider, I know this is a kind of recent example, and I appreciate this is just one I've just picked out to highlight the, the application of this strategy. But something you could consider is saying, okay, why don't I put half the stop where I probably, I don't I don't really want it here, but I kind of, if I want to take the trade, I'm going to have to kind of join the crowd a little bit, but I put half the stop then lower. Now that moves your average stop level you know, and you're going to take a little bit more risk. You have to accommodate the size has to accommodate that. But what it does do is, you know, understand, and again, this is all context based, right? The context of the trade you're taking is the most important thing. And if you think this is a rotational market, I'm an uptrend, there's a good chance this is going to kind of move lower. I'm trying to time this. Do I wait? Do I take it now? How do I kind of line this up, line this deal up strategically so that it works out in a risk reward ratio, does this and does that. And sometimes you have to play the game of, okay, they put a stop there. That's the crowd stop. Fine. Suck it. Get on with it. Now, below. Let me put it a little bit below. Split the stop up. Have your average stop there. Now, if you get pinged on half, fine. You're taking a little hit on one, and it rallies back up, and you're making the rest of the trade. The trade is working for you. And if you get hit on both, and it carries on moving much, much lower, fine. 
your average stop level is a little bit lower than it would have been. So this is something, the point of this is it's something different other than joining the crowd or having a really wide stop. You can consider splitting up your stops. And I've used an example here of half here and half there. That's fine, but maybe you can consider different types of things like a quarter or 10% or whatever it may be. I mean, I wouldn't, 10% might be a bit much if you've kind of got 10 stop levels there. But the idea is you're not necessarily all in or all out. So something to consider. Okay. Just checking the the clock. We're good. Time based stop. So uh, uh, this uh, these are some of my favorite ways to deploy stops. And let me tell you why. The the reason I like a time based stop is the market is very rotational in its in its movement and its rhythm, and it does things. It repeats its things during time of day. Uh, you know, I did a podcast a while ago with a chap who you know he trades um, DAX. And he, you know, he, talk, he, he, he takes that on board a lot about time of day rhythm and structure. And you probably know yourself, if you're trading a, a very specific market and you're focused on currency pair or whatever, is there's times of day where you often get a rotation, where you get that kind of spike into highs, um, you know, this, 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 this kind of general common pattern that happens, not always. So a time-based stop is basically saying, hey, listen, rather than it just touching I am going to wait for price to spend a certain amount of time, let's say under the key level if you're long, or for a bar to close. So the advantage of this is you aren't getting pinged out on a wick or spike, but the disadvantage, of course, with one hand I give you, the other hand I take away with trading, we know how this works, you lose some control over your risk. And so you you know, you know, might say, oh, do I have an emergency stop in? We'll get to that in a moment. But what you're kind of doing here is saying, okay, price has come to this level, I would normally be stopped, but I'm going to wait for a little bit. I'm going to see how it behaves. Now, okay, as I said, there is there is you do lose some control of risk here. If it carries on motion and motion and motion, you need to do something about it, right? But if you're in a rotational market and, and price isn't coming back, it's moving and squicking about, you probably don't want to deploy that where it just touches and moves away. Because it's not giving you a chance to observe price action. It's not giving you a chance to assess things. And let me give you an example here. Like, let's say you've got this, this stop level at highs. You've sold double top. Great. Now, as it comes back up and retest that level on USD JPY, you, you start a clock. And you say, okay, I'm going to give it five minutes. If it stays above this level for more than five minutes, I'm going to assume this trade is no longer valid. I'm going to come out. If it doesn't, then great. I, I'm going to stay in the trade. So it's something you can kind of consider doing. You might also want to add a, a, a line in the sand emergency stop so you combine the two and say, hey, my stop is really above that high. I'm going to observe it. If it stays above the high for more than five minutes, I'm going to come out. But if it carries on going, there's my line in the sand there. I'm going to come out. So what this does is it allows you to kind of get in, into the groove and into the rhythm of market of the market structure and say, hey, you know, we could we could probe through highs. I don't know how far we'll probe through highs. Um, I'm prepared to give back a little bit of risk, a little bit of control over the risk for the chance of it coming back in my way and my favor moving in my direction. So, you know, really think about that. And I use that a lot. And again, it's a personal thing. You know, it, you have to be disciplined. You have to really, you know, not just say, oh, I'll see what happens, I'll see what happens. And you have to be, you, know, you start a timer, boom. Okay, if it stays up here for more than 15 minutes, I'm out. And very often, you know, the fear that I know you're saying in the counter to this is because this is this is logical. What if it just keeps going and going? Well, how'd emergency stop him? But if it breaks that level, then then the market's no longer, the trade's no longer valid. And fine, if you want to, you know, have that one touch stop, then that's great. But you and I both know that the market conditions are very, very different now than they were years ago, or you know, they change all the time. And we are probing these levels all the time. So you have an operational commercial decision to make. Do I wait for the probe, the pin bar through and take that? Or do I take it now and allow for the pin bar through? And just kind of having a little bit of kind of timing and going, okay, it's broken through. Let me see if it holds that. Then I'm going to come out, ditch it. If it comes back in, then great. I've allowed it a little bit of room. It's not a perfect solution. Nothing is, but it's something else to consider. Okay, we're good for time. Stops with discretion. <laughs> this is where we get controversial. And I've mentioned this before, and I got a lot of flack for it. I'm like, listen. Don't give me any flack about this type of thing. You, Everything that you do in trading is your own personal decision, right? If you choose to trade with a discretionary stop, which we'll explore now, then that's your decision. There's a lot of people out there who do very, very well trading without stops. Now, does that mean they don't close losing trades? No, no, there's a distinct difference. 
some people out there are trading without stops, but they're observing price action and they're saying, hey, this isn't the price action I want. This is the level breach that I don't want. I'm going to close it. You know, and that's up to them to do that. They don't have a line in the sand. They look and observe and they adjust and they kind of, you know, see what's happening and make the decision. But as I mentioned here, if you're going to do this and you're going to have stops with discretion, you have to be so, so disciplined because this will run you over. The one day that you don't have a stop in and you're using discretion and you're not on point and you're not ironclad with the discipline as the day just goes on and on and on and rips and rips and rips and rips and you just get your face caved in. And no one wants their face caved in, right? You have to be on point and dialed in with your discipline and have a clear set of rules of how you will exit the trade that's not going your way. So let's explore. So imagine if you're in a trade, you can say to yourself, hey, I will consider. And that's where a lot of people go, oh my God, consider. I either come out or I don't. Bear with me. You'll consider closing my trade if X level is breached. So you've got a line in the sand and you say, I'll consider it. Fine. So what will make you decide to close the trade? This is when you as a trader can make an operational decision in the heat of the moment. And I want to remind you of that slide before, that's why your discipline's got to be dialed in and you've got to prove that you can make those tough decisions in the heat of the moment, the heat of battle and pull yourself out of the trade. You know, and I want to be clear on that because if you're not, do not even to attempt this but if you have got good, good discipline and you believe you can pull yourself out of the trade this is something potentially to explore because you can say hey that's a line in the sand there fine but what am i did i just mute myself i thought just out of excitement i think i'm muting myself no i didn't i think i'm good um you're going to look at these considerations price action time so how long does it stay up there the price action does it wick up there and pull back straight away does it stay up there hold above the level the volume into it the time of day we are is it in the middle of the day is it a day when there's generally a turning point is it a day when we generally probe for liquidity and pull back like you know sometimes when the um european session uh, comes to a close 4 30 the dow will have a little stretch final push us indices final push rotate back lower you know it's understanding the relationship between kind of some of the rhythms and rotations in the market the volume, the volatility spike. So these are some of the considerations that you might take. So let me give you an example. So you're in a trade, price spikes into your stop zone. But you look at that and say, man, it's just spiked in there out of nowhere. There's a volume come out of nowhere. There's no news. It's just a little spike. It's run out of steam. I'm going to give it some time. I'm going to give it a few minutes. This is my discretionary element. I'm going to see what happens. And if it holds there and carries on, you cut it. You don't open your ticket. You're out. You take your medicine. You walk away. You look for your next deal. If it then comes back, you can say, okay, fine. Now I can put my stop where that, that spike was and I've structured the trade a little bit more. Now, of course, if it runs straight through and carries on, you're going to have to, again, have the discipline to be able to pull the trigger and get out of the trade and stop the rot. But this gives you a little bit of flexibility. This allows you to be a little bit more discretionary with it. And again, you give up some control of risk. You don't you have no certainty of risk. You've got an idea, right? You've got an idea. You know, like It's not going to suddenly go from I know 500 bucks risk to 5,000 unless you let it, but it might be 600 bucks risk. It might be four. You know, you've got a kind of a window, but it's not a definite amount. If you can deal with that and you have the discipline to pull yourself out of a trade that's not working, it's something to look at. So the second thing is price moves into your stop zone. You don't like the way it's trading close immediately. So that's how you could operate it. You could see the price goes into your stop zone. I don't like it. I'm out. And that's the trader, mature trader in you looking at price objectively and saying, I do not like this. The way this has come in, I'm not interested. I'm going to pull it right out. Okay, number three, price breaches your stop level. And it pauses. You immediately place a stop behind the recent swing. So it comes in, breaches the level. You're like, ah, let's see how it goes. Rotates back lower. Now you put a stop behind that recent swing. You've got a place to structure it. And again, there's like some 50 50. There's some people like, oh, this sounds dangerous and stuff. And yes, uh, absolutely. If you haven't got the discipline to be able to pull yourself out of a losing trade quickly like that and make an on the fly decision within structured guidelines, definitely don't do it. But if you're one of the traders who's, you know what, I can do this. This makes sense. I can observe. I'm prepared to maybe give myself a little bit of extra wiggle room just to see how price trades. Because if you kind of look at probability and options theory, I'm not a huge options kind of theory um, formula analyst, expert, whatever you want to say, but the probability of touch is twice the, the probability of, of it close, of the of price closing there, if I said it right. 
I'm digging well into a realm that I'm not an expert in. But the point is, is that the likelihood of touch is twice as likely as the as the price closing there. I think that's right. So, you know, why don't you use it as your advantage rather than disadvantage and say, hey, let me just see how it behaves. Let me just see how it reacts. Example, FTSE coming down. You want to go long. You've got a stop zone there. And I kind of use this as this, the zone tool on trading view, the rectangular zone tool, stop zone. Okay. And there you'd say, right, if price goes there, I'm going to use discretion. If it goes out of the zone, I'm out. That's my line in the sand. But if it goes there, I'm going to use discretion. And you watch and you observe. Price enters the zone and you decide to hold. You're like, okay. And again, I'm using kind of an example here. It's three o'clock UK time. Typically, the market turns after that point. We get a 30-minute drive in, in the Dow or the S&P. We get a reversal, typically, not always, typically. It's a price action doesn't look that weak. It's probe lows. And it's kind of sat there, popped back up. I'll, I'll, I'll see how it goes. And so you can use discretion. And I, I, and I appreciate, and I'm not saying, oh, I'm, I appreciate this is hindsight. I appreciate with this example, we're cherry picking hindsight to illustrate the point. I'm not saying this is kind of going to happen all the time, but I want to kind of show you the concept and, you know, understand that this is something to consider a reasonable stop zone. Let me observe it. Okay. What has it got going for it? It's got this going for it. It's a rotational market. The market often rotate, often moves away at this level. Maybe you're looking at the, the S and P on the other screen, maybe you're looking at other stuff that you use to make a decision with and you're saying, Hey, the Nasdaq's gone bid here. Dow hasn't really pushed lower. FTSE's drifted lower. DAX is holding okay. It's three o'clock. Let me just see. Let me just give it a bit more room. Let me just give it a few more minutes. It starts to pop up and you go, okay, great. Let me let me now drag my stop below that low. So you can see you've given away some control of when you come out, but you've given yourself a little bit of room to play with within a zone. And again, I, I do recommend a zone rather than the whole thing. And you don't want to be doing headlights and it's going lower, lower, lower. It's trading at 6,000. You're like, well, you know, it still could turn. You know, five years later, and you, your margin called out. So example here with a kind of losing trade, market pops up. You say, oh, you know what? I like that. So I'm going to hold it. Let's see what happens. It's okay. Comes back, pulls a wick. You pull the stop then to that wick. And then in this example, it will get stopped out. So that's how you would do it. Rather than having a stop just above that high, that open, I think I didn't include the x-axis on this one. Never mind. Imagine that's the open. It looks like the open to me. You say I've stopped above there. Oh, I don't like it. I'm out. I stopped. I'm done. So it's discretion with a little bit of kind of rule-based discretion, some guidance there. Okay, so let's talk about uh, moving stops to break even. <laughs> Again, this is a, a kind of really um, polarizing subject, and I think it's personal rather than tactical in, to some degree. Let me explain what I mean by this, because some traders say it's a false sense of security. Like, why would you put your stop to break even? The market doesn't care. You stop is you're doing this just because you don't want to lose money, blah, blah, blah. And other traders say, I want to take the risk away from the trade straight away. As soon as the trade goes in my favor, I want to wreck it to break even. And I don't want to I don't want to lose in trade. I do not like losing trades. I'm prepared to get pinged out on many, many trades that stop me out and then go my way, then go my way or go in my favor. And I'm prepared to take that consequence. I just don't like them. And that's okay, right? I don't think it's a silver bullet. Uh, Peter, who does our, we do coaching calls twice a week. Uh, Peter does our call today. He's going at seven o'clock for members. He always pulls a stop to break even. He just wants to see the price go in his favor, pull the stop to break even, let me see how it goes. And he'll hold a trade for you know, thousands of pips potentially. And he'll get pinged out on some. But it's the psychological aspect of it. And remember that when you move a stop closer, you obviously, hopefully this makes perfect sense, you increase the odds of it being hit. Right? The closer the stop is to current price, the more likely it is to, to be hit. So you need to decide if you want to make that exchange. And this is where it comes in with where I think the setup comes in with the psychology. So the psychology, let's wind back a little bit before we move forward. The psychology is how do you feel when you get stopped out? How do you feel giving back? kind of big profits and then seeing you lose money, just going kind of green to red hurt you psychologically? Does it frustrate you more than others? You know, what's the issue with that? If that's a problem, then, you know, moving to break even might solve this because sidestep slightly guys here, often we do things in the market that aren't logical. They don't make sense. They don't have much edge, but they give us psychological edge. 
They give us the opportunity to stay focused. We don't go on tilt. We don't make silly mistakes. We stick to our rules. And often some of the rules that we implement and some of the tactics we deploy aren't there always to give us more reg and to make more money. They're to stop us from doing silly things and making bad mistakes. And so often some of these little things that we do, they might not seem logical on paper and all these kind of armchair traders who haven't risked a penny in their life or very little are saying, oh, well, you know, tactically that's the wrong thing to do. Well, okay, fine. If you look at it from a pure textbook perspective, but some of the things that we do in trading are there to serve our mindset, are there to keep us from getting frustrated, to keep our confidence high. And so this might be one of those things that you do. You do this to keep yourself on the straight and narrow and focused. So some things to consider, the trade setup you're taking, is it momentum trade? Does it mean reversion? Are you doing A to B type trade? Do you look for a potential runner? How much juice do you think you've got in the in the trade in the deal? You know, maybe you don't want to tighten the stop too soon because if you tighten the stop too soon, you're giving up an opportunity. Wait for this for so long, it's come back, it's tested level. I want to take it. You want to do this. I'm ready. I've been waiting for this. Pull the trigger. Maybe like okay, until it really kind of got, gets going and gets in the cruise and gets some kind of cushion on there. I don't want to move the stop because I don't want to give up this opportunity. I'm prepared to still pay that amount for the chance of this going in my way. So these are all kind of tactical decisions to make. So some ideas to, you know, for this this whole break-even conundrum, if you like, is, again, have, have, um, even if you're using a discretionary approach, like it, I should have mentioned this really in the prior couple of slides, it still requires planning. So you don't leave everything to completely shoot from the hip. You structure this in the plan and then say, hey, the discretionary element is there. Is that part of my plan? So let's look at it from this perspective of moving the stop to break even have a fixed price target where you move that stop to break even so when the price hits x level now i'll move it to break even or if price has traded for an hour and i'm in favor and i'm in uh, sorry, profit i'll then move my stop to break even and then consider splitting again 50 percent to break even 50 percent where the stop originally was you don't have to do it's not your or nothing and something you know i think is very very important is to just study your prior trades Look at what would have worked. There are some traders out there who are very, very good at getting the right direction quickly. And they get that initial pulse, that momentum, but then it kind of flakes away and comes back. And then the trade kind of dissipates out and doesn't really work and they, they lose money. So if, if you're that trader who's very good at getting that initial move, then why not use that to your advantage and pull the stop to break even? But if you're a trader who's a bit early and price kind of goes your way, jostles around a bit, a bit of noise before it finally gets going, then maybe you don't want to do that. So again, it's adjusting, it's adjusting your tactics the way that you trade. And it comes, you know, from from journaling your trades and documenting your trades, looking at your maximum adverse excursion, maximum favorable excursion, all that type of thing. But you know, the one thing is definitely reminding yourself, hey, sometimes I don't do things purely for logical operational edge reasons they're there for psychological reasons and that is okay sometimes as long as you know why you're doing it let me give you one more example before we move on to this kind of last couple of slides here you know scaling right sometimes you have that internal voice markets moved higher you're long great you're up good it's at a key level you're like oh you know, I want, I want to take this trade off now. I want to grab that. I don't want to lose that that profit. You know, I'm up a couple of grand on that trade. It's going to come back. Oh, you know, yeah, but I'm trying to look for more. Oh, you've got this internal dialogue, right? And you might have a plan that says hold it, but you've still got the internal dialogue. We can't stop the internal voice telling us to take a trade, take a trade. I don't want to see that five grand disappear, whatever, whatever you're, you're playing with. And so you might just feed that, that voice 10% of your trade. There's no logic to that. That makes no sense operationally why you're doing it. Just feeding out a couple of contract, a couple of lots. There you go. You feel, and then it just soothes that internal dialogue. It makes trading easier for you. You're not frustrated. You're not making this FOMO revenge trading. Like I scaled a bit and it's such a meaningless amount, 10% or whatever percentage may be, but you've kind of done it for psychological reasons. So don't be afraid to do something for a psychological reason to keep you, the machine, the engine the operational person who's doing the do as a discretionary trader on top form. You know, it's not always about optimizing, optimizing for edge. Sometimes it's optimizing for you and doing some things like that sometimes is the best way to go. Example here, let's say you sold double top. Once it broke lower, this would be a tactical reason why you might consider moving to break even. And you wouldn't do it until you got that break of structure, breaking the low. If you're lucky enough and it was still in the range, to so sell the high, still in the range, you wouldn't move it. But when it did break structure, 
you would move it. Okay, we can have some Q&A now, guys. But while you're sticking your questions in the questions section, um, reminder, crowded stops. Think about where the crowd is placing stops, where they aren't placing stops. How can you use that to your advantage? Or is it not or is it not to be looked at today? Is it something completely different? You're like a trending market and it doesn't make sense? Or does it make sense? What's the crowd doing? The crowd is mostly wrong. I don't want to fight the crowd all the time, but in conditions, certain conditions, I do want to take into consideration. Break even. When do we pull the stop to break even? Should you pull the stop to a break even? Um, under what conditions? What setups? You know, it doesn't take long. Just get a pen and just have an idea and think and just spend some time. Screens off, charts down, broker shut down, sit in a chair and just think and say, hey, you know, when do I really want to put a break even? When did it frustrate me if it comes back? Am I okay? And just kind of formulate those ideas, the rough ideas in your mind, and then put them in concrete in your in your kind of plan. Tight stop rules, talked about that. Splitting up your stops, something to consider, and discretion-based stops. As all of this stuff, guys, the risk, just understand your job is to manage risk. How you do it is up to you, and it's your decision. It's your money. You're the one trading it. You decide how to manage risk. As long as you have got a really good risk management strategy in place, that's fine. Whether it's discretion, whether it's a tight stop, whether it's putting to break even, whatever it is, you choose something that fits your style, your strategy, and the way that you think about the market. Everyone is very, very different. What works for one doesn't work for another, and what's awful for one is very good for another. So it's really just sitting down with it again. I know I'm big, a big, big fan of this. Just sitting down, screens off, sitting down in a chair and thinking like, hey, how do I want to deploy risk management? What works for me? Am I comfortable having discretion based on or must I have on a line in the sand that cannot be breached? Am I comfortable doing this? What would make sense? Allowing yourself to think a little bit differently from the crowd rather than being so focused on everything that we hear and read, which most of the stuff is good for brand new traders. They should have a structured stop. You should, if you're brand new, stop here, target here, don't do anything, just execute like that. But if you're a little bit further around the journey, then you can play a game of being a little bit more flexible and stuff. As long as you are managing risk and as long as you aren't doing silly things like averaging into losers, as long as you are coming out of your losers when you should do, then to me, there's no harm uh, in doing that. All right. So I hope that's some value. Let me um, just take a look at the questions. You can type the questions in the chat uh, whenever you want to do. Let me try and find the window. If I can find the window, I will be ah, pop out that question that there. Okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. So let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, Terry said, would you say it's possible to use intuition to set stops or move to break even? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. The danger you've got, Terry, is this. And this is where a lot of people will go, oh, no, don't use intuition. We are discretionary traders. We should be using intuition to some regard. But when you're a beginner trader, we confuse intuition for just a guess, right? And that's dangerous. So if you're, depending on, I don't know how long you've been trading, Terry, if you've been trading for a while, then maybe you can say, okay, well, what what part of, what part am I allowed to use intuition? You know, am I allowed to kind of be a little bit more smarter about where I put my stops? Am I allowed to be more intuitive or should I be very structured? And, you know, discretionary trader is a lot of intuition there, but Screen time is what helps you build intuition. Otherwise, it's just a hunch. And hunches are dangerous because you don't know what's right and what's wrong. So if you're very early on in your trading career, I'd say be very, very structured, very, very focused, and don't have any intuition into your trading. But then as you progress through your career and as you improve as a trader, you can have rules that keep you focused on, I'm only going to trade this environment, I'm going to trade this pullback, blah, blah. But actually, I'm only going to risk X amount of money but I'm going to allow myself a little bit of room of my position size within this and this. I give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. And then as you progress even further in the years down the line, your kind of decision making becomes that much intuition and maybe that much that much rules because your kind of rules are embedded into how you trade and how you operate. So I think it's something to nurture is probably a good way of doing it. Um, Daniel said... 
Yeah, which are better for beginners trading? I'm looking at the other screen, by the way, guys. Uh, which are better for beginners trading stops or bracket OCO stop plus profit? Beginner OCO stop plus profit. Don't meddle with trailing stop. Personally, personally, I feel like trailing stops add an extra element of complexity to your trading strategy that is not required when you're a beginner. Just be very structured. There's my entry. There's my exit if I'm right. There's my exit if I'm wrong. Run with that for a while. Do not kind of deviate from that and don't be seduced by kind of trading this way, that way, the other way. Just be very structured. Jot down what's working. Go back, review, iterate, improve. I hope you guys can see me. I've got a couple of lights on me. It's getting dark here. Typical. It's properly awesome kicking in now, isn't it? Um, Artie, if you're using, how you doing, Artie? If you're using the discretionary stop, is there a way to track your average RVR, etc.? Do you look at it by MAE? Uh, if you're using a discretionary stop, okay, is there a way to track your average RVR? Well, do you look at it by maximum adverse excursion? Um, I think if you're if you if you're kind of looking at your average RVR, you're going to look at your results, right? You're going to say, okay, what was my risk on the trade? You're still going to you know, have that idea of thinking, uh, okay, there's my stop area. Um, I know what you're saying. So you're saying, okay, let's imagine we have the discretionary element and we say that's the stop area. How do we really kind of get a grip on the risk reward ratio of the trade when the risk element of the trade isn't that structured? I get it. Okay. So this is where you kind of go, okay, listen, I've got a rough idea where I'm going to come out of this trade. This isn't really putting me in a box of, oh, it's a really, really structured trade and this, that, and the other. And maybe I could have lost more than I actually did on the trade, all this type of stuff. But I think you know roughly where you would come out. You've got a, a, a zone, an area. And so if you like logging the data, you could maybe say, okay, this was my zone of areas, my discretion. I, I and, and log the fact that you did decide to use discretion and log the result of that. I think that's kind of more important in a way. And then now and then when you take hits that you don't like and maybe you hold them a little bit longer than you should and you were going, oh, you know, I'm going to hold it and, and it ended up being a bad move for you. If that's more common, then perhaps you go, you know what, well, maybe I, I need to just cap the discretion. It's not doing me any favors. The point is to try as a bit of an experiment and uh, I say almost disregard the kind of traditional metrics of risk reward ratio for now, just to see if adding that element of discretion helps you or not. And look at the kind of raw data and go, hmm, being discretionary with my stops has helped me a bit. It's kept me in some trades. I've noticed a bit of a, you know, an improvement. But then the next step for you then, Artie, is to say, okay, well, okay, fine. That's helped me. How can I maybe firm up my stop rules based on the discretion? So maybe you've gone to discretion for a couple of weeks and been a bit more flexible when you come out. You looked at how you've done that. That's improved your results. You go, okay, well, how can I add some structure to that? So maybe you don't want to stay discretionary all the time, but maybe it means you need a little bit of a wider stop. Maybe it means, that, okay, well, actually, I would normally do that. I'd normally have a wider stop, but hey, in this, in this instance, I've, I've been a little bit more uh, strategic with things. So yeah, be, be be mindful of 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 doing that. The risk reward ratio, traditional metric, perhaps can't be used as you'd like in this example, um, but you can probably firm up a strategy that then can work like that. If that makes sense, doesn't. Hopefully, it doesn't make some sense. Uh, but that's a really good question. And, and it, we're just, just touching that for a moment, Arty, because you know sometimes trading is a little bit loose. It's a little bit grubby. It's a little bit out of control. It's not quite all i think as many traders as humans we like things nicely categorized in a box and this and that and the other and sometimes trading is a little bit grubby you know it's a little bit kind of confusing it's a little bit stuff's all over the place you haven't got quite the data you want you're kind of running a little bit by the seat of your pants and it's working but I don't really know why it's working but i'm not going to complain and i'm going to keep doing more and maybe i'll do this and do that and you're kind of running a little bit you don't really know what you're doing but it's worth it's a little bit like that and the traders that do the best the ones that embrace that a little bit and say hey this isn't quite as clean as crisp and clear as i'd like but it's kind of working i'm a discretionary trader i'm a day trader i'm working with what i've got and and the numbers are okay so i'm going to keep going at least as long as i keep that risk managed and i don't do any damage to my account then then carry on and then other times things are kind of you've got them in a nice little box you've got a strategy you've got your risk and alert and it fits quite nicely but 
I think being able to embrace the um, dynamic nature of trading and, and the, the, the sort of confusion of trading, uh, if you like, is is something to consider. Uh, Cynthia says, oh my God, I've got a few more minutes. Thank you for your questions, guys. Uh, have you ever come across someone who dedicates hours a day to learning analysis and still never succeeds? Yes, Cynthia, sadly. Um, there are people who, you know, well, things you don't know, they say they put the hours in. You never know, right? You can't monitor someone all this time. Um, but some people who say, oh, I've been doing this for many, many years and blah, 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 I've done this and done that and I'm still not getting anywhere. Um, and you, uh, I've heard that. But do they really put the work in? Are they really kind of going through the process? Are they really thinking longer term and saying, hey, I just need to you know, think a little bit more strategically about what my next step is, not worry about P&L, just nail this down, the next step, the next step, the next step. I do believe that if you do that and you look to the next step and you don't always think, I just want to get to profitability, I want to get to profitability, you go, right, what's my next step? Okay, my next step is is really sorting out a strategy. Under what conditions? Okay, these conditions. How will I deploy this? That, that's really, when I see people do that, then they've got a really good chance but occasionally someone has got a really deep rooted issue with discipline and they never deal with it. And they're always you know, trading on tilt every now and then. And they've got a the great strategy. They make great returns. The equity curve is looking really good. Every now and then they break a rule and do big damage. And they never address that. So I think it's making sure you address you know, the issues that you need to address in front of you now and, and thinking of it like a stepping stone. I'll talk about the Stockdale paradox which is you know really understanding where you are now being brutally honest about your current position as a trader but also being super optimistic about the future and i think generally if you approach it, trading with that manner then you know you're going to get some results you might not hit the if you've got big big goals you may not hit those but you'll definitely definitely get improvement um vukasin is there any tool that can help us see how crowded levels are uh, there used to be a tool, man. There used to be a tool that um, – and I tried to find it because I was going to put it as a link for you guys, but I couldn't find it. There used to be a tool that showed you where retail stops were positioned. But honestly, if you look at a chart, you can probably pick them out below the low, above the high, um, within a reasonable range of the current price because most people don't want to lose more than a certain amount. Most people are trying to trade as much leverage as they can. So that's why price moves in rotations – Look us in. It goes, oh, I'm going to push up a little bit. It pulls back down, push up a little bit, pulls back down. Those rotations are pretty much where everyone has their stops because they're leveraged up and they go, oh, I don't want to risk more than 100 bucks, whatever. And they put a stop there and they get stopped and wonder why because it's not reached in a structured place. So uh, I don't answer your question. There was. I, maybe you could find it again. Maybe do some Googling. If you find it, let me know. But honestly, you don't need it. You can just look an eyeball and go, you know, I can see exactly where people's stops are. Let me not be in the same place. Uh, ATR stops. Hemal says ATR stops. Yeah, I love ATR stops, Hemal. Um, uh, I think also for entries in some conditions, like at the moment, you know, especially if you're pre-data, you start the average 24-hour range of the NASDAQ, 200-odd points, $200. You know, if you're entering route two hundred dollars you're using an, an extra fifty dollar stop or whatever you can structure trade target entry and stop on atr that wasn't your question though was it the question was atr based stops i think it's good because it calibrates to conditions and it allows you to say and it allows you to not think about things and go hey stops are a nemesis for me they're a struggle they're a challenge it's not working i seem to be getting stopped out i'm trying to be too clever let me remove that lever or that that impact or that variable is the, is the correct term on the trade, remove it and just have an ATR based stop and just be fixed, fix, use that, use that, use that, use that. And then you go back and see what you did and how your trading was. And then maybe you can refine it and adjust it. But it's a very, very good tool to use and a good place to start. Um, best advice for a beginner. Do you know what? Just observe, observe and take notes. Because this is a long answer. I won't I won't do a long answer. Um, but observe, take notes, come up with a plan, come up with an allocation of how much you want to risk, get yourself to a demo account, try it out, get yourself into a live account, very, very, very small, and just write down what you're good at and what you're not good at. And just don't try and rush things. Just take time. Recognize it takes time. 
observe the market, come up with ideas, read, learn, and don't expect it to happen very instantly. There's it's probably more to that, but um, hopefully that helps to some extent. Um, Barry said, thanks, Mike. You mentioned in the past that the issue of bad stocks may be, in fact, a bad or late entry. Exactly. You need to be patient to allow your criteria to set up, and this can be a delayed entry. Do you have any strategies that can help with this other than trying to anticipate the trade and getting you in before your trigger? Thanks, Barry. Hey, Barry, if this is where you come in and you go, right, let me use a wider stop. Let me, let me no meddle with my entry yet. Carry on with your entry, but use a wider stop for now. Reduce your size and then see what happens. Kind of see, hey, am I getting, is a trader always going against me? And if that's always happening, you're not going to get stopped because you've got a wider stop, but you're going to look at it and go, man, you know, I'm early. I'm really early. Okay, so how do I fix this? Do I just trade with a wider stop and accept that? Or do I try and finesse my entry? And one way of doing it, Barry, is to say, right, what about a timer? I've got a timer on my desk where I go, right, don't let's wait another minute. And so price might come to your level and you go, I'm always early or not always, most of the time early. Bang. You wait a minute. And you're sitting there, it's the longest blade minute of your life, but you're waiting and then you execute after a minute because you know that actually the majority of your trades, if you just wait another minute or five minutes, whatever time frame you're trading on, will be better for you. Um, but it's I could go going back to the initial point, it's diagnosing. It's stripping out the uh, many variables you can and then diagnosing the problem, just like you would do if you're a, you're an engineer or a mechanic or a doctor, or whatever. You strip out everything else and you go, right, let me diagnose this issue. And let me try and change this sensor or whatever. We use the analogy of kind of looking at an engine. Has that done anything? No, but I need to eliminate everything else first and then this and then this. So same thing with trading. Move the stop wide so it eliminates that as an issue that could be detrimental to your performance. Look at your entry, excuse me. And then say, ah, make some adjustments after that. Uh, Nada Nada has said, uh, I hope that's helpful, Barry. Two more minutes, guys. Uh, thanks for the info. Um, where can I get trained with a mentor, one to one, or part of a group? YouTube is full of unrealistic content. Join an academy training center. Uh, Nada, if it sounds like you've been planted there as a stooge, and I can promise you, you haven't. You can join Traders Mastermind, Nada, Nada, if I've mispronounced it. Um, if you want to join our community, we're good group of traders pretty serious about training we've all got ambitious goals we do group coaching there's a community there's loads of kind of content to download if you're interested tradersmastermind.com if you're not just make sure you listen to the things that resonate with you the right podcast the right content there's, there's there's lots of kind of valuable free stuff out there and yeah youtube is a lot of nonsense there's a lot of good stuff as well but i think it's being very specific about what you're trying to improve with your trading am i trying to improve my discipline am i trying to improve my am i trying to come up with strategy and then relentlessly working on that one thing uh all right i'm gonna have to run through quick because i know peter will be doing his call in a moment does it make sense to keep a tighter stop hey chris uh if i allow for the possibility of taking a second entry yeah you know a second bite of the cherry i think that's okay you're a bit more of a seasoned trader, Chris. You kind of have recognized that actually I don't, I'd rather have a chance of a second trade rather than using twice the uh, stop distance. I think that's fine. As long as you don't fall into the trap of the death by a thousand cuts where you're taking four or five bites of the cherry, you're getting stopped out, you're getting frustrated, you're now down 5R and it's annoying you. But I know you know that. So yeah, I think that's that's fine. Uh, thank you, Gary. Great session. Uh, Gary said, understood, agreed, dynamic. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gents. And we're on time. Good, good, good. Pleasure having you here. Um, have a good Fed day tomorrow. <laughs> Happy Fed day. Let's see what happens. Uh, and don't get seduced by volatility. Plan your trade. Be strict. Be structured. Confident. Keep risk managed. Back again for another webinar. Make sure you're on the email list, tradersmastermind.com forward slash email. And I will let you know when the next one is. Thank you, ladies and gents. Take care. Bye-bye.